Hi everyone, welcome to week seven of How to Survive Your PhD live broadcast. This week we're talking about curiosity. And for those of you who have just joined us, um, we have been eating chocolate from the uh, fine neighbouring shores of New Zealand. I was in New Zealand all last week and uh, the guys are going to tweet a picture of me standing in front of a hobbit hole to prove it. Um, I want to thank the team last week and Steph in particular and Katie of course and everyone for uh, doing the live broadcast in my absence. It looked pretty amazing. I saw lots of scroll back action and uh, it looks like lots of um, fun, nerdy fun was had. So thank you for that. Um, Katie's been very busily editing all the lovely videos that you sent in. I've seen the first cut. Katie, are we actually going to tweet the sneak preview? I can definitely do that. She's going to tweet the sneak preview of of the videos. First in fact, there was done. the first one's done. There were so many fantastic things on those video clips that we are making how many now? Oh, at least five. At least five, we think. And we'll release them and we'll put them in the course and all over the place. So they were great. Thank you so much. Uh, big shout out to Oz Julian Cox, who I know can't join us tonight in live chat because he's going to a very special dinner because he visited us on campus today. I couldn't make it, but I saw great pictures um, of you in the God's Cafe. So Thanks for joining us, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it. And um, as usual, all the links and resources that I'll mention tonight will be going out on Twitter with the Survive PhD hashtag. And we will storify this chat along with all those links, and we'll put it up on our um, on the site and on the course for you to share and enjoy. Okay, badges. They make you feel so good. All the love for the badges. Um, today, um, the badge on the forum is going to Annex 9 um, for the post, Curiosity, what does it mean in your language? Which reminded us all that curiosity and all its connotations vary according to your language and cultural views. Thank you so much for that interesting contribution. Um, we're also giving a badge to Goal ZM for very thoughtful responses to the discussion questions. I'm just going to chuck my piece of paper down there. Um, and on Twitter, we'd like a big shout out and badge to Tracy E. Griffiths. That's at Trace T E at T underscore E underscore Griffiths on Twitter for making a very lovely story fire called How the Owl Got Her PhD Topic, um, which we thought was very creative and also useful and great learning. Thank you for that. Um, and also to at Doc Pip NZ, who I believe is online tonight. Hello, Doc Pip. Pip NZ, we've noticed um, how lovely you are in the community and how you just contribute through general awesomeness. So thank you, and we're sending your badge your way. So curiosity. Well, I said to Katie, what's been happening on the forums while I've been in New Zealand? Because you know, after about Tuesday, I couldn't really log in because I was, you know, going to hot springs and all that kind of lovely stuff. And um, yes, I am making you jealous right now. They're just <laughs> it's Katie standing there with her hands on her hips. Anyway. I said, so how's it been going in the forums? You know, what's the general mood there? She said, actually pretty good, you know, no crises, uh, no melodramas, no dramas. Um, just really some interesting and thoughtful responses. And we, we talked about this for a bit and we thought maybe it's because curiosity is the first really kind of positive emotion we've discussed, even though, of course, we discussed some of its downsides. We also talked about how important it was to our research. And a lot of the questions on the discussion forums really reflected the importance of that within our research, and some of them questioned that. So the first one I'll pick up is from Amita K, who says, the challenge I experience is many times I see students who don't display any curiosity. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming Amita is actually talking about undergraduate students here. I don't think I've really discovered that in PhD students, but hey, it might be possible. It appears that their aim is to do what's required and get over with it. This frustrates me as I know the value of knowledge that's been offered to them and how it could change their lives. And I know the cliche, says Amita, that even if you change the life of one student, it's a victory, but I'm greedy. I suppose I want to reach out to them all or as many as I can. I want to see enlightened faces walking out of my classes. I keep trying various ways through teaching, media, hands-on activities, etc. And each has its own success ratio. So my question is, does anyone know of ways to instill, and I know that we are naturally curious, or to trigger the curiosity in others? Um, now, uh, there was a few responses to this and, and people sort of echoing that they would also like to know the trick of engaging undergraduates. And our moderator, Katie, pointed out that people, uh, particularly in undergraduate and coursework, often have different motivations to study. 
and that might affect what they're willing to participate in, how engaged they are. And they made that she made the point, I think, in a well-made point, Katie, over there, Katie, yes. um, that academics need to model a curious mind for their students. I mean, if we're bored, they're bored. Um, and I think uh, PhD students sometimes don't get a chance to teach to their topics of interest. Sometimes they're just teaching other things, and maybe bringing that animation to the to the class can be hard. I know in my years of undergraduate teaching, sometimes um, it was hard to bring your best to every class, especially when you're rushing between lots of them because you're on casual appointments at about six different universities, but don't get me started. <laughs> um, uh, Goal ZM shared the interesting observation. Um, said, I read on a higher education blog that postgraduates sometimes aren't able to reach lower performing students because postgraduates have been atypical themselves. Mm -hmm. Usually high scorers, high levels of curiosity, and therefore perhaps don't understand the mentality of students who are struggling. And this really resonated with me, actually. And one of the best advices I've ever had about teaching is that sometimes the best teachers were actually the worst students. I was a really bad student for most of my undergraduate degree, actually, and I still think those experiences serve me well today as a teacher. I remember what it's like to fail, uh, to feel hopeless and to feel like I'm just never going to get it. And I bring that to my work as um, in thesis whispering for sure. And um, I was idly Googling the topic because I thought, I wonder what's out there on the internet. And I discovered an interesting post which um, the team are going to tweet on how to be a high performing student, uh, which I wish I'd read back in my undergraduate years. And maybe we'll give you some tips about how to help your students become more high, uh, high performing. I also found a blog post on Edutopia, on engaging students through setting different expectations, which is interesting. And I think the person did it through a wiki. Uh, so you might be interested to read how you can maybe use some of that technology. Uh, and Goldsab again came back, and this is, I think, why I awarded the badge, because I thought there was really thoughtful engagement there. Suggested using a range of media and examples and talked about how they had used uh, celebrity couples to talk about marriage and values. And I thought, wow, I wish I'd been in that class because I want to talk about Brangelina, why not? Yeah. Um, and that a cultural or social understanding of the students and where they're at is clearly an advantage as a teacher. But of course, it's very hard to achieve and it's hard to stay current. Uh, I couldn't find the current list, but every year they publish a list, and maybe one of the team can Google for this list. Every year they post a list of all the cultural references that are now obsolete for your students who are undergraduate. It's really worth reading because you might think, yeah, I've updated and I've used that Harry Potter reference, but hey, it might be out of date again. That's so depressing. It is. It's <laughs> depressing and it really, really makes you feel old and it's really stopped me from using so many Star Wars references or at least using the different characters. Oh, I know, oh, right? Okay. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you do it? I mean, um, how do you keep engaging students? And I think um, most universities, I should point out, have professional development for academics to improve their teaching. And they can. these classes obviously can help us with these skills. Here at ANU, and we'll tweet the link, we have a professional development unit for teachers. Um, but see, have a look at that. See if you can find something similar where you are. My recent research with Will Grant is showing, and, and with Steph who's sitting over there in the corner, is showing that a knowledge and theory of practice around teaching is really advantageous in the job market as a PhD student graduate. So if you're up for the job hunt and you're interested in being an academic, it's really in your interest to, to take one of those courses and be able to demonstrate that knowledge. So further in that same thread, at KDTORA, K-D-T-O-T-A-R-A, Tara, I'm going to call you Tara made the important and valuable contribution. Um, and she says, I'm assuming it's a she. I've met a number of students who are also traveling the career PhD path as I am, many of whom have had grants provided by employers or industry funding bodies, who've had the scope and the direction of their research specified for them. And they found out that they almost have a feeling of shame that what they're doing in their PhD is just for work. I feel as though our experiences, challenges and achievements are devalued by those who emphasise the need for passion and curiosity of strivers for the PhD. That because we are not doing it for the right reasons, that it's somehow a second class qualification. She carries on. Why is it not enough to do what is required and moved on? We've acknowledged through this move that the PhD is a stage, it's not a Nobel Prize, it is not all that will be all and end all of our existence. We all work through essentially the same process with the same sort of learning and the same end point. If my passion lies elsewhere, why should that be a bad thing? 
that really pulled me up short and I thought wow this is a, a sort of a, a narrative or a discourse of you must be impassioned you must be taken up by your topic and the idea that you can feel like a second class citizen I could definitely see how that can happen and I think it's really worth reflecting on for a moment are we actually creating two classes of PhD students here the passionate and the pragmatic and um, I really would sort of value your input on Twitter or your ideas on this or maybe to talk about it further in the MOOC because it certainly seems like something we need to talk about. No resources, however, sprang to mind, I have to say, to answer the question. I think it's more of an existential rhetorical question than it is a question that needs an answer. But I typed it into Google anyway. I actually typed, literally typed, passion in the PhD, is it always needed? Got to love the Google. Sometimes you've just got to tell it exactly what you want. And um, I got the first hit on a thread on Quora, which is a question and answer forum if you've never encountered it before. And the question that was being asked was, should I do a PhD if I'm not currently passionate about the field? Why or why not? If not, what should I do? Um, we'll tweet the link to, to that discussion. There were about 25 responses, and most of them were pretty good, actually, but overwhelmingly they told the person that passion was important. So again, that discourse, that narrative was getting reinforced by other students. One of them actually said, if you have to ask whether or not to get a PhD, the answer is not to get a PhD. It's sort of like asking whether you should get married. If you have to, have to ask, the answer is no, um, which I thought was, you know, pretty much sums up that attitude very well. And the arguments in the rest of the thread um, boil down to two reasons why passion is crucially important. Um, first of all, is that it's really important to be realistic about the work you want to do post PhD. So if you're working in a topic area, you're becoming an expert in that, you're making connections in that, and you're not intrinsically interested in it, are you setting yourself up for a career that you're actually not very interested in? Maybe. And secondly, people were saying that passion helps in the face of those more difficult moments in the PhD. Um, and I think that's certainly true. Um, others argued, and I think more interestingly, that there's other ways of engaging in a field you're passionate about other than researching it. And this, I have to admit, resonated with me. Um, just because you love something now doesn't mean you have to love it forever or that you will love it forever. Um, my PhD was about hand gestures and architects and I never did any more work on hand gestures and architects than after I finished. I do like it when people write to me and say they've read it and they've used it in their PhD or that it's carried on research some other place but it doesn't really feel like my child, it's just out there and all the time I was doing it, I was wanting to come back to a career in research education. So gesture was never my primary interest, but I was interested in gesture, interested enough to sustain me over four years. And so I think there is a place for the pragmatic phd -er, I'm calling them, someone who's more interested in the qualification themselves than the topic. Um, but it might be hard to sustain motivation on that alone. I'm not sure, but you're really interested in your views. And I think um, a blog post is brewing in my mind about that for sure. So thank you for that contribution. Um, also, are we allowed to admit when we fall out of love with our topic? You can say it here, it's safe. Have we fallen out of love? It's something we're going to pick up in our module on boredom, which I keep saying is my favourite module, and I hope people, I'm not overselling it, but I did love doing the module on boredom, and I think uh, something I don't talk about very much, and we'll pick that up more. So... Carrying on, Chris Desire, great name Chris, wish that was my surname, Chris Desire writes, um, in this module it was mentioned that ensuring that you are not reading too little but also not reading too much, I know that's a kind of mixed message, sorry about that, but it's sort of true, um, Chris carries on, this is something I've struggled with and I always wonder whether I'm reading enough, at the start of my PhD I was reading whatever I could get my hands on, however more recently the amount of papers I'm reading has significantly decreased. I skim over abstracts of new papers in the field and read the ones that seem related and interesting, but I do worry I might miss something important through my diminished amount of reading. Is there a guide or some way to tell if you might not be reading enough or even too much? Now, I want an app on my phone like I've got on my Fitbit, right? And so the, everything I read then, it kind of gives me, like on the Fitbit, gives me numbers of glasses of water and I can tap it every time I do a glass of water. And it shows me in my jug how much water I've drunk and whether it's enough. But there is no such app, unfortunately, for the PhD. If there was, I would make it. Um, but I think this is a really difficult question. And a couple of other questions on the thread reflected the difficulty of this. Phoenix Angel Fire, great name, by the way, uh, asks, when is it time to say stop? No more, enough is enough. 
Does this question also haunt your waking hours? If it does, is the solution? what is the solution if there isn't, even is one? It seems that every new day brings another novel idea, a new approach, a question to be resolved, an interesting subject to include in the ongoing discourse that is our research. And wow, that feeling when you're really firing on all the PhD cylinders is amazing, isn't it? It's like all the little bits in your brain are connected up and everything you read and every input and it's just like your brain is on overdrive, it's overclocked. That's a great feeling, but it's pretty exhausting. And when do you know when to stop? When do you turn it off? Have you got enough? And Kat, also further down in a similar thread, asks, when should the literature review end? I was once told this, this ends once you start collecting data for your research. I don't think that's true, Kat, by the way. Um, but how can this be as new information is constantly being added? It's a very big and classic PhD mistake to stop reviewing the literature and start doing the rest of your research. The literature review should be still touched right up to when you submit. People have done badly in examination because they cut off the literature three years ago and didn't revisit it again. Um, so never be told that somehow the literature review stops. It's a continuous process. Weaving things in as they come with what you're doing is one of the key challenges of the PhD and actually really difficult to do. And knowing when to stop, yes, it's really hard. Quite a few people responded. I liked what... Um, and I can't even say this, C-A-3-A-K-H said, I think it was quite sensible. <laughs> I missed something. It's your worst nightmare, isn't it? I missed something. And my PhD examiner simply said, you might want to read this as you take this research forward, but we know you can't read everything. It was a very important thing, but it wasn't essential because I'd read everything else. Does that help? There's no real rule book here. And I had exactly the same thing on my examiner's reports. Three things were pointed out and said they could have been discoverable, but they understand that the researcher sometimes just doesn't discover these things about how you might want to look at it. Uh, coincidentally, one of them was one of the examiner's papers that I didn't include. Anyway, so <laughs> that's, that happens. Um, now, I've written a lot, a lot of posts on reading and writing and knowing when to stop because it's a question I get all the time. Um, so the team are going to tweet out a few that I'm going to mention by myself and by others. So reading like a mongrel is one of the really early ones I did. In case you're not familiar with Australian slang, a mongrel is a dog of mixed parentage and usually quite vicious. Well, that's what they say. A mutt is what it's called in other countries. Um, in this one, I talked about sort of the practices of skim reading and why that was kind of okay to do that. Because when I first started reading for my PhD, I thought I had to do everything properly and um, if I didn't do everything properly, I really wasn't doing my PhD and skim reading wasn't allowed, but actually skim reading is inevitable. And um, I had a student come up to me after a recent workshop here at ANU and said, said um, I'm, I'm at ANU now and ANU is a really good university. I thought I'd better change my reading habits because I always skim read. And I thought students at ANU don't do that. And students at <laughs> the universities do. <laughs> And I thought it was a beautiful comment because it's so true. We can get into these really weird thinking patterns about um, reading. It's important to read for accuracy. It's important, of course, to, to make sure that you're extracting what's valid and, and knowledge claims from the literature. But if you're skim reading, it's okay. Everybody does it. Um, PhD Talk followed up on that post, um, which is a very old post of mine, with a really good one. In fact, I think better than my post in lots of ways, where she... Um, she categorised different phases of PhD reading. Um, she calls them, and thank you, Eva, for this post, by the way, the novice, the apprentice, the sponge, the concluder, the interrelator, and the mongrel. So the mongrel is part one of the types of reading that you can do. It's a really good post worth having a read. The team are um, putting it out on Twitter now. Um, of course, Pat Thompson at Thompson Pat. Uh, my friend and collaborator did a great post about why reading for your PhD is so hard. Um, and I'm sure it'll resonate with many. And one of the paragraphs in that I'd like to read um, really stuck with me. The difficulty of picking between hard and poorly written texts is particularly an issue for people early in their academic adventures. Doctoral researchers often find that the books and papers that they encounter don't yield much at the start. And PhDs don't necessarily know whether this is because they aren't sufficiently at ease with the stuff being discussed or whether they've just happened across a text that is thick dull, plodding, and isn't worth pursuing. I love how Pat writes. Um, it's true. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between writing that's just bad and writing that is hard. And in academia, that line is very blurry. 
Um, I tried to put some practical suggestions for sorting through the literature and dealing with literature on surviving the reading marathon, which the team hopefully are wearing their fingers to the bone. They're also intently typing over here. I'm assuming that it's going out okay. It's going well. It's going well. Thank you, Crystal. Um, ben from Literature Review Post then wrote me a post on why he hates the mar marathon metaphor when it's applied to writing. And he talks about sprint writing, which is an interesting counterpoint. In short, what can I say? There's no really good solution to this problem. Until that app is made, we're all just struggling with it. I struggle with it as a working academic. You talk to any working academic who's interested in their craft and they will tell you the same thing. In Wormhole Literature, I uh, post that I did most recently, I think, I talked about how reading in your field can be watching, like watching a picture come into focus. And that if you're being methodical enough, um, you will probably end up reading pretty much everything you have to read if you're following procedures. And by methodical, I mean keeping records of your search terms, um, Google alerts, keeping notes, um, tracking citations, and, and looking at the threads in uh, the key debates. If you are confused about any of this, get thee to a librarian um, promptly. They will teach you about citation searches you won't know yourself about <laughs> how much easier um, those alerts make that whole process of keeping up to date. Um, there's a book um, which tackles this topic very specifically called Demystifying Dissertation Writing by Peg Boyle Single. And we're going to tweet the link. I find, I have the book, I find the system is way too rigid for my taste, but there's some really good ideas in there and I just pick and choose the things that I want from authors like that. I don't like to adapt the whole system if it means changing my whole life. I haven't got time for that. Um, and the book at the moment is $9.99 on Kindle, so why not um, if you want to check it out? Okay, uh, now on to another difficult topic. How much time have I got? Eight minutes. Okay, Wide White Stage asks, how do you deal with straddling several disciplines? Different audiences bring different prior knowledge to the table and have different expectations. How can you best succeed when working in a relatively new field that draws on several others and make sure your work is taken seriously? A really, really key pressing issue for so many. Uh, which is why I think similarly, Dramal8 asks, how important is multidisciplinary interprofessional research and how should the scientific community encourage and support it? Um, interdisciplinary research is clearly a pain point for many. And in a recent post, um, one of the most popular posts I've done recently, published recently is by Alison Crump and she talked about managing conflicting advice um, from your supervisors and this is often the case um, for uh, people who have supervisors in different disciplines. Um, now there's an emerging interest in the research on research field of which if you'll remember I'm a proud member. Um, <laughs> it's a thing we actually do research on research and there's a paper which we will tweet the reference to uh, Blackmore and Nesbitt, Identifying Risks for Cross-Disciplinary Higher Degree Research Students, Proceedings of the 10th Conference, and 10th Conference on Australasian Computing Education. And this is half the problem with my field is that we write in so many different areas, it's very hard to keep track of, of where things are published. But this one happens to be in a computing journal, go figure, but it's useful. Now, in this paper, they draw attention to the following problems. So overly ambitious research projects, different disciplinary expectations from supervisors, breadth at the expense of depth or vice versa, supervisor workloads being doubled rather than halved. I think that's a really important one. Um, both supervisors are trying to provide all the input rather than sharing it. Conflicting feedback, of course, difficulties in writing conventions, style expression, even referencing. Um, difficult choice in examiners and then difficult post-career issues. What department do you belong in? You know, where do you fit? Um, I've put an image from the paper, which we will appropriately reference for the team to tweet if you can. Could you do that team? They're doing it. Okay, Crystal's doing it. She's doing it. I don't know. What are you doing? Uh, I can I do it later. It. Okay. It'll be in Storify. It'll be in the Storify. <laughs> It will definitely be there, I promise. Uh, it's got a table that pretty much lays out what I was just saying. So many potential problems. Uh, but so much innovative work depends on cross-disciplinary work these days. I mean, back in the 17th century, all you had to do to get a PhD in Europe, which is the system that we copy, is read one book, and it was the Bible. And so now we've got masses and mountains of reading, and, and the areas for discovery are really in those hybrid cross-breeding um, disciplines often. For instance, there's really interesting work going on here at ANU on looking at uh, medical anthropology, so looking at teeth 
and where what people were eating back in various tribes and then how they migrated, things like that. So, you know, fascinating research in that area. And, um, you know, we need to keep hammering away at this because it's difficult. I'm getting love hearts there, probably because there are those amongst you out there, and I'm sure they're talking on Twitter about... Yeah about inhabiting this space and it's hard and I think we should we should um, respect the work um, now basically the best advice that I have and the only really valid advice I think that works is to you when you're putting the PhD document together you need to think about it from the point of view of the reader who is the reader what discipline are they in very few people are in more than one discipline um, so you may write for one discipline and bring in the concepts and, and ideas from the other. So, for instance, it's my work. As I said, I did hand gestures. They aren't very good hand gestures. <laughs> in architecture classrooms, who was I writing that for? Was I writing it for people who nerd out on gesture? Or was I writing it for architecture teachers or for both? And it was kind of for both. And because it was for both, I had two literature reviews one of them for people who had a background in communication and one who had a background in architecture. And that way you could read one or the other or both. And the examiners really liked that approach. And I got that idea actually from a book called Authoring Your PhD by Patrick Dunleavy. Um, we're going to tweet the link to that. I found it very helpful. But of course, um, it's written more for the humanities because this is where these problems tend to lie more than in the sciences, which often have the IMRAD formula, Introduction, Method, Results and Discussion. Um, and have to follow certain structures anyway. You may or may not be aware that Patrick writes a great blog on Medium and we'll tweet the link to that. I do enjoy his posts. They're usually pretty interesting. And um, Patrick is a professor at the London School of Economics, but he also has a fellowship here in Canberra at the University of Canberra, interestingly enough. Okay, finally, I think finally, Geoffrey Goff asked, can creativity be taught? And people said no, and people said yes. And as a former architect, I can categorically say creativity can be taught. I taught it for years. Um, there's many, many techniques I could talk about it. Bore for Australia, as I'm so fond of saying. Um, I don't know if you can teach it. It's more like cultivating it, um, nurturing it. Um, and there's no real time to outline all of those there. Um, uh, but uh, Daniel Kaitan, in a similar vein, asks, innovation is such an important attribute. Why isn't innovation assessed specifically in PhD examinations? And the answer, Daniel, is that it is. It's one of the key criteria in examination. And for a good outline, but of course, as I think, Katie, you were the one who pointed out, that it depends on the definition of innovation. I can't remember. But <laughs> the innovation... Oh, like I would say. <laughs> definition, it's clever, so therefore it's something you would say. Oh, definition of innovation um, is context-specific. It means something different in different disciplines. And... And for how um, examiners internalise this, you cannot go past the seminal paper, which I've mentioned so many times, by Dr Margaret Kiley, proud um, staff member here at ANU. Um, uh, it's a PhD, not a Nobel Prize. OK. Uh, massive thank you to the team for the supporters ever. And I just remembered that I forgot to say who was here. So I'm just going to show you that it was... Uh, here we are. Jonathan. Love to Jonathan. And I just have to rotate now. Steph. Yay. Love for hey Steph. Guys. Love for Crystal, who's looking a little bit Can't see her. Manic. She's down here. Can you see oh, her now? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Katie is ever. Hello. Hey. Hey. Which Thanks, I thought Katie. as I wrote it as Deb's net called um, the lit review, kind of managing it, the reading FOMO. Fear reading uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. Yeah. 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 Reading FOMO. Um, Definitely. Ash from Oz asked, um, how do you present two lit reviews in your thesis if you're interdisciplinary? Like, how do you do a lit review from one field and then another? Well, you just say it in the introduction. You say, um, when you do the synopsis part of your thesis, you say, part one of this thesis is literature review, and it's in two parts. Uh, if you have a background in X, read this one. If you have background in Y, read this one. Or if you're really nerdy and you're totally into it, read both. Um, and obviously, they want to be a little bit shorter. And um, in that book... Uh, there's also the concept of the shoulder review, which I didn't end up using, but I was really tempted. So one review at the start, mm -hmm. bunch of stuff, shoulder review, bunch more stuff. He has this whole concept of looking around a room. I can't really explain it here, but it totally makes sense. 
Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is from Suze Bradbeer. Mm -hmm. and she says, what are good questions to ask a librarian and not look stupid? Ah, oh, mm -hmm. oh, see, cool. see the, the key thing there is a Trish, is it? Did you say uh, Trish? Suze. Suze. The key thing in there, Suze, is librarians are the kindest souls in the entire universe. And appearing stupid in front of it's just what they deal with every day. And if you and they love it. So they love problems. So that first of all, don't ever be afraid of appearing stupid in front of a library. Thank you, Brent Cunstock. You're right, they never think you're stupid. Okay, secondly, uh, the really key thing that you can learn from a librarian is citation searching. So how to to trace the threads of a debate through how people cite each other and how to look at the metrics around the citations to see uh, where the clusters of, of data sit. Someone should do a social network analysis tool where you can just sort of plug in. Someone might have, if someone knows of any the of internet. these, the internet might know that somewhere, of, of how to do that, is to, um, to, to, to visualise it as big clusters would be amazing. Um, but uh, just a simple that simple technique, and you can and it it's done differently in different databases basically. So it's sometimes you need to be taught how to do it in say Scopus or Web of Knowledge. Um, Google of course has it very simply. Why can't everyone be Google? Um, and the so that that's one thing that the librarian will teach you. And there was another thing that was on the tip of my mind about citation searches that have met. That, oh, uh, the other thing that they will teach you how to do is alerts. So setting up alerts in various databases, um, good search strings for alerts. And so that's once you've set that up, it all just sort of comes in auto magically. You can set them up for weekly or for monthly so you're not overwhelmed by it. And, um, and so um, the reason that you go to a librarian, I mean, you can kind of work this stuff out on Google, but each of the databases is very different. And sometimes just how your library proxy works with your web browser, whether it works on campus or off campus, getting them to help you set up these things straight into your reference manager. If you're using something like Papers 2 or Papers 3, please Papers 3 start working because you're driving me crazy. <laughs> Um, if you get it set up straight into those um, browsers, then you can, from your reference manager, search the, the databases and it's all beautiful things. So librarians can teach you that. Other questions? I've just been reading all the wedding congratulations. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone see any? No. Mm -hmm. Love for librarians. Love for librarians. Yeah, lots of love for librarians. Okay. Well, if there's no other questions, then next week we are doing a module on confusion. Am I right? You sound confused, so I must sound be. confused. <laughs> and I'll be honest with you, I found this module really hard to write, and I hope that it's not hard to read. The team tell me it isn't. Um, and uh, we'll be sending out tomorrow morning, as usual, uh, the instructions for the discussion forum, and I think that's about it. So, uh, yeah, are we done? Are we out? Are we finished? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, we look forward to talking to you next week. Bye.